Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia. Welcome back to another episode of our Suzerain Let's Play. As we continue from Chapter 1, we set our economic strategy last time, and we end up picking the electric high-speed railroad from our capital to Lake Haven, which is our birth town, uh, the two dominant economic centers of our country. And now we have our inauguration ball to go to. Let's go. I just finished the I just finished buttoning up my suit jacket when the doorbell rung. The presidential guard has arrived to pick us up for the inaugural ball. The ball was a three decade old tradition, breathlessly anticipated by politicians, bureaucrats, and the press. All eyes were about to be on me. I called on Monica, our wife, to get the children ready. Looking in the mirror, I straightened my tie and took a deep breath. After tonight, there would be no turning back. Suddenly, Deanna, our youngest daughter, uh, our daughter, only one daughter, our youngest, um, hugged me from behind, startling me a little. Monica had fixed her hair into an elaborate braid, woven through with ribbons. Papa, Mama told me it's time to go. Let's say, hello darling, I'm ready, where is your brother? I think Frank is still upstairs. She shrugged. It was almost time to leave. The big ball was starting in less than an hour. Now, where is my first lady? Monica came down the stairs. She was wearing a simple yet elegant beige sheath dress and short heels. Her hair has been neatly pinned into a chignon. Chignon? I can't pronounce this, uh, showing off the pearl earrings I had given her for our 15th anniversary. All those years, she had stayed by my side. Now we're about to begin the most challenging chapter in our lives yet. How do you do, Mr. President? Mm, let's embrace her. I pull her into a deep embrace. Monica, my love, you look as gorgeous as the day we married. Now there's that charm that got you elected. Frank trudged down the stairs. This thing itches. Frank tugged at the collar of his new tuxedo. He seemed ill at ease. I'm glad to have you with us for this big night. Sure, Dad. I'm just dying to go. Papa, are these people going to be around us from now on? She pointed at the presidential guards at the door of the house. These people are friends, Deanna. It's alright, baby. They're here to make sure nothing bad happens to your papa or his family. Monica held Deanna's hand. Together, flanked by the guards, we walk out the door. Halfway to the car, Frank stops abruptly and turns towards me. Dad, do I really have to go? Could I stay home instead? Hmm. Let's go with this. I'm nervous myself, Frank, but I'll feel a lot more confident with my son by my side. Frank smiled reluctantly. Well, when you put it like that, sure, let's go. The presidential guard showed us the way as red and blue light flashed around us. Sergey, my driver, ushered us into our armored limousine. The motorcade started to moving towards the palace. I gazed out the window, deep in thought. Anton, what are you thinking about? We come a long way together, haven't we? Yes, we have, and there's still so much that we'll accomplish side by side. Just remember, no matter what happens, the children and I will always be here for you. I'm going to help Papa fix everything. Frank rolled his eyes. I know you will, honey. This means a great deal to me. We're a family man. We chose to stick with our family in both of our kids' birth. After what seemed like a few minutes, the convoy uh, slowed to a halt. Sergey rode down the limousine. Soundproof partition. We're here, sir. Hope you enjoy the drive. Let's ask how he is doing today. I'm just as good as I can be, but today's your day, sir. I'm glad you're in charge now. You know, my entire family voted for you. 
I won't let your family down, Sergei. I don't doubt that, sir. You're the one who sparked a glimmer of hope in us all. Sergei opened the door for me. The normally imposed palace was festooned with garnished banners and nearly made it look cheerful. A line of shiny luxury sedans stretched around it. Politicians, bureaucrats, and celebrities, the creme de la creme of Saltland's elites, streamed inside the building. Good luck out there, Mr. President. I'll see you on the trip home. I stepped out and immediately found myself surrounded by loud voices and camera flashes. Hordes of eager journalists thrusted their portable microphone my way. And we got ourselves just a generic reporter. Uh, SBC, Solen Broadcasting Corporation, owned by the Marotti family. Um, my guards fended off most of them, but one woman managed to dodge them and corner me. I recognized the SBC logo on her press lanyard. Mr. President, Mr. President, do you plan on working together with the opposition parties on the expected constitutional reforms? Hmm. If the opposition is willing to support us. Mr. Richter clarify that as long as you support their demands of democratization, they will work with you on all issues with a corruptive spirit. What do you think about this statement? Hmm. Let's just say I can't comment, have not seen his statement yet. One more question. One of your first acts as president was to sign a campaign finance law allocating public election funds by seats in the assembly as opposed to the number of votes. Is this a deliberate attempt to defund the Communist Party and the Buddha Workers Party, neither of which have reached the election threshold? Hmm. It's ensure the USP has the funds we need to stay in power long enough to truly bring democracy to this country. That's enough, ma'am, said one of my guards while nudging the reporter away from me. A path through crowd was now open and quickly made our way to the entrance of the palace. At the same time, a dozen fireworks went off. The entrance was decorated with beautiful ribbons in Sutland color of white, yellow, and maroon. A lush maroon carpet had been rolled down the stairs. We entered the lobby and joined the throng people making their way towards the ballroom. Behind me, I heard a familiar voice. There they are, the most beautiful family in Sutland. Uncle Peter. Hi, Uncle Peter. It's great to see you. You two are growing faster than I'm getting wiser. You are a sight for it. Let's just be friendly with him. Are you sure you've gotten any wiser, Peter? Maybe not. After all, I'm still sticking with you. Happy to see a familiar face, Peter. Evelyn. Peter's wife, Evelyn. Uh, the journalist, right. And the teacher. Approached us, shook our hand with a firmness that bellied her delicate features. Congratulations, Anton. I have to say the results were clear to me from the beginning. Thank you. We both work hard to make it happen. We know you did. You deserve that. You deserve the position. And tonight, we reap the rewards. I hope you show the same enthusiasm on the job. Of course I will. You know me. I work as hard as I play. He gave a short smile that looked halfway genuine. He seemed uncomfortable. Monica, how are you? You barely said a word. I'm more than relieved to have this roller coaster ride over with, but of course, now the real work begins. Ah, yes, managing the help, planning parties, daily trip to the saloon to look your best for foreign dignitaries. Don't be so old fashioned, Evelyn. I plan to use my powers, First Lady, to advance the position of woman throughout Sutland. Equal rights for our sex are long overdue. Wouldn't you say, Anton? Absolutely, we'll work together to achieve that. Monica flashed me a smile. Deanna suddenly jumped in between us and tugged my sleeve. Papa, can we go? I want to go see the ballroom. Of course, darling. We left the lobby and made our way towards the ballroom. Inside, we were yet again surrounded by a noisy crowd, but this time, 
It was the politicians who thought to appease the new authority in Sutland. I spent the next few hours shaking hands, joining various conversations, and some serious, some superficial, and making speeches. We finally settled down at our dinner table with the Vecterns. As the band started playing some slow jazz tunes, oof, that was tiring. Another drink? Well, suddenly a loud banging noise echoed from the outside the ballroom, then another, and another. The musicians stopped playing, everyone in the room was looking around in confusion. Peter and I turned toward each other, realization dawning on both of our faces. Fireworks. No, gunshots. As soon as Monica heard the words, she lunged from her seat. We shield Monica and the kids. Papa, what's happening? I knew it. We never should have gone, Frank. Chaos broke out as some gusts flung themselves under their table and others ran towards the door, screaming. Deanna burst into tears while Frank tried to comfort her, hiding the fear in his own eyes. Three more gunshots rang out loudly. Mr. President, are you all right? Chief of Police, Carl. Um, real quick blurb about him. Sworn in by the mayor prior to the appointment was the- Oh, he came in with Lilius. They both from Arvory. Okay, no real political affiliations here. Running towards us with three more officers in decorated uniform, they all had their guns drawn. As soon as he made it to us and saw that we were on harm, he let out a big sigh of relief. Thank God. Status report. One second, Mr. President. He quickly turned around. He turned around quickly to the men. Check the perimeters now. Paul, Jansen, follow my lead. We'll bring them to the safe room. He now turned to Monica, Evelyn, and children and spoke in a softer voice. Do not worry. The situation is now under control. Please follow me. We promptly followed Carl through the winding halls and corridors of the palace. His men still hold, had their gun drawn, which did nothing to ease the tension. On the way, Peter made an attempt to break the silence. What a fucking night. You can say that again. Carl turned to us with a serious face as we're about to round a corner. Quiet, please. Sorry, I talk when I get nervous. Peter, shut up. Carl flipped a switch on the wall and a panel opened, revealing a hidden staircase leading to a large reinforced door. Inside, a set of emergency light flickered on. The safe room was comfortable and spacious with expensive looking leather sofas. Small security monitors on the wall displayed grainy footage of each room in the palace. There was a boardroom, a pantry containing enough provisions to last month. Monica and Evelyn sat the children down and started wiping their tears. Carl stepped away from us and made a few radio calls. When he was done, he returned to me and Peter. So, what's the status? Carl's radio suddenly cracked to, crackled to life. Every second felt like eternity as he pressed his ear to the receiver. When it fell silent, he turned to us. Good news, we're not in any danger at the moment. The situation has been dealt with, and the perimeter has been secured by the guards and the police. He glanced towards Monica, Evelyn, and the kids. If I may, sir, he gestured towards a more private corner of the room and started speaking more quietly. This is what we know so far. We have conform confirmed that two people were gunned down in front of the palace. The attacker is one of them, and we have reasons to believe he was working alone. He fired three shots at the MP, one to the head, one to the body, a uh, two to the body, instantly killing him. Which minister? Presidential guard at the palace immediately shot and killed the attacker. He was not identified yet and will require investigation. The MP that was killed is identified as Bernard Sakarkis. Right, the poet. Home city of Dyer. He's the communist, right? He had an increased influence bringing communism. Interesting death here. He's a assembly member, basically. First communist to be elected to the assembly. That was a fast death. This is huge, Anton. This will cause a lot of problems. A lot of problems. Peter pulled out two cigarettes and handed me one. He then turned to Evelyn. I could hear him trying to assure her that everything was going to be all right. Monica was still trying to tend to Deanna as Frank paced the room, mumbling that he should have stayed home. 
Comfort Monica and the kids. We're safe. I'll make sure everything's going to be fine. We can't be sure of anything anymore, Anton. I lit my cigarette and took a deep drag. It was going to, I was going to see this through and keep my family safe at all costs. I crushed the cigarette in, on the ashtray. We got ourselves quite the ball. President Rang signaled a possible cooperation with Frank Rector of the uh, PFJP. The bill was necessary for democracy. MP shot. Nation in shock. The Red Youth. Hmm. All right, before we jump into anything, any other news? No, just the capital. Security report. Security in the capital have been heightened. Emergency meeting. The mood in the situation room was gloomy. My cabinet member would gather discussed a shooting outside the palace. Lilius presented the initial report. Bernard was shot dead at 9.03 p.m. in front of the palace gates. He was an elected independent member of the assembly, and as you know, a famous communist. She spat the last word out with some distaste. The guards at the scene were 50 meters away and immediately took action by responding and killing the assailant, who was identified as a member of the nationalist organization Young Sods. The president and his family were unharmed, thank praise God. What was the motivation of such a horrid act? Our investigators suspecting a political assassination since the Yonso had been threatening the communists for some time. This set a dangerous atmosphere where the left versus the right political violence of the 1920s might spark once again. A return to those days would be devastating. The coup are the reason why our country stagnated for a decade. Minister of Justice sighed. The Red Youth has condoned, condemned the killing, but didn't stop there. They promised revenge. This will, in turn, spark farther aggression from the young sods. The whole cycle started because Bonarsa has expressed his views. We cannot simply look away. Nia has always been one, the only member of the Justice Ministry truly deserving of the name. She has survived countless attacks on her character while fighting corruption within the Ministry and rising to power only to compound her sense of moral duty. Freedom of expression is part of our constitution. We cannot have anyone, let alone an MP, shot for voicing different opinion. Huh. All right, let's just protect the freedom of speech here. Our laws do, and for good reason. Our laws do, and for good reason. Silencing voices only result in fear and stagnation inside society. We had that before, and know very well how it was. I hear your concerns. Our police do their best to uphold the right of our citizens. We'll prevent such an act from happening again by making sure our security measures are re-evaluated. Minister of Defense uh, grunted approval. He towered over the rest of us in full military uniform, his many war medals conspicuously on display. Agreed, ma'am. Our um, Gandamir will. Right, the, the armed forces, the law enforcement organization, right? Armed law. So basically, I, I don't know if this is the police or like a special department, but, anyways. We'll also boost security in the rural area where possible. There might be more to come. We should refrain from making the issue a political one from the start. Lucian, our strategist, is pitched in. You'll only add fuel to the fire. It is political though, isn't it? Yes, but we need to calm the country. If we take sides, we could escalate the situation farther. There aren't many sides, the state versus its enemies. Several police cars rushed past the Maroon Palace and everyone went silent. Regardless, a full investigation on all involved parties is underway. We will find subversiveness, uh, sub subversives and punish them soon enough, Mr. President. I will do my best to help coordinate the administrative task. Justice will be served and the rule of law will be returned to this country stronger than ever. 
Only if we stay vigilant. Only if we stay vigilant as a country, we must think about the upcoming budget. Oh, jumping to a lot of points. We do intend to strengthen the military spending, so I don't see any issues with this statement here. Even though this one might be a bit softer, but let's go with this. I'm sure the Minister of Interior has already taken the necessary precautions. You can be assured that our police units and intelligence units are on increased threat condition. Nobody should be able to move a finger against government officials. Lucian took some notes after checking the latest newspaper and reports. It seems that the tension between the communists and nationalists will escalate farther. It will be very difficult to pass any meaningful change if there is chaos in the country. Yeah, we can't fix the recession if there's instability. You're right. We need to trust our minister to stabilize the situation if it comes to it. This will be it for today. Then we'll convene again soon. Thank you all and keep us updated. Hmm. Another difficult situation. And we have one news and seems to be the next chapter. Murder at the Palace. Breaking news. Prominent independent MP known for his communist romanticism had been murdered leaving the Moon Palace grounds after inaugural ball of Anton Ray. Politically motivated. Right. Nothing else to look at. Time to continue here. Okay, we're just loading here. It's like, for a moment, I was like, should I click something? Oh, it's still in chapter one. Okay, interesting just transition there. All right, still about the politician death. 53. Repeatedly received threats. Traitor. Unity despite differences. All right, this is kind of my message too. Murder was a method of the past. Hmm. He's also talking about unity. Given that this is the left paper, they will be the most favorable to the death of, well, speaking on the victim's behalf. Bailing out businesses, the only way out of recession. Oh dear. Okay, all right, got a general gist. Let's see what some local reports are. Illegal firearm found in Communist Party office. The Ribery Police Department raided the local Communist Party office. Right. That could be a retaliation attack planning. Gotta be careful about that. Foreign affairs. Diplomatically critical, the imbalance of the trade between our countries concern rise over how much more selling profits. All right, they want to reevaluate trade negotiations. That could be a difficult thing for us to deal with. Valgan, Communist Party leader suspect of bomb attack, unattended bag in front of NFP office. All right, so we have some retaliation from the communists against the nationalist front. Understaffed police officers working with head of police to address the situation. Yangso youth wing leader has been has claimed responsibility. Oh, in an attack on Buddhist market, the death of seven. So we have some domestic terrorism basically. <laughs> A KA 74s guns, AK 47s. 
Okay, so we got some no suspects. A lot of weapon hits. Pathway in the mountains that allow traders of the state escape to Sutland. Want us to increase border security against escape political opponents, I guess. All right, in Gen, weapon seize in cultural center. Dating 1929, but kept in good conditions. Police overburdened, escalated violence. Hmm. Basically, we have a country with a lot of issues. All right, let's first read the local report. Two Buddhist women with affiliation to the Buddhist Freedom Front has been charged in Hossard before they could execute a terror attack at a crowded rally. Both women are listed as wanted criminals and enemies of state. The arrested women have admitted their intention to attack the National Front Party rally at Seoul Square, where Kipner gave his speech but rejected any connection to the BFF. Both claim they were acting alone. Police report the situation was under control and further investigation are underway. Right, so we have some hardline nationalists and then a lot of marginalized forces who are hating the nationalist force. We have a dinner with a family at home. Let's do that first, something friendly for a moment. After a long day at the palace with family home, I thank Sergei and walk through the front gates, nodding at the two guards as I went by. Even as I turned the doorknob, I could hear Deanna rushing the stairs to greet me, open the door, and there she was. Standing in front of me with expectant eyes. Papa, you're home. And we... Let's just lift and hug her. While trying to put the key tree next to the entrance, she was growing fast. Lifting her up was no longer as easy as it once was. How was school? Boring. I liked my old school better. I put her down and her expression turned serious. Papa, are the bad men gone? Yes, Papa took care of everything. Okay, Papa. Mama, Papa's here. And Monica appeared with the apron and a spatula. Deanna, what did I tell you? No running in the house. Yes, ma uh, mom, ma mama. Monica approached me, kissed me on the cheek, a tantalizing smell whiffed from the kitchen behind her. How was your day, dear? Terrific. I finally got to do some grocery shopping, just like old times, and I'm making your favorite. You mean, yes, Lorsha. Lorsha was a Lock Haven specialty, usually reserved for special occasions. A rich seafood stew with a hearty garlic and paprika kick. Mm, sounds good, actually. It was, an ap it was absolutely my favorite dish, especially paired with keb cabbage. Cabbage? Anyways, a potent unfiltered wine from Bergia. Mm, let's just kiss her on the cheek. I just want to cheer everyone up a bit. Her smile faded and she lowered her voice so that Deanna couldn't hear, especially after what happened at the ball. I'm worried, Anton, for you, for the children, and for the country. Deanna suddenly appeared next to us. Mama? Yes, sweetheart. I'm hungry. We'll eat in just a minute. Will you help me set the table? Anton, can you tell Frank to come down for dinner? He's been sulking in his room all day. Monica started taking out the china while I headed upstairs to fetch my son. Loud rock and roll music echoed down the hallway from his room. I caught a faint hint of cigarette smoke. Knock on the door. There was no response. Knock on the door again. There was still no response. Let's uh, use our voice. Turn down that racket and open the door. The stereo on Frank's room clicked off. All right, all right. He unlocked and opened the door. What do you want? Mm -hmm. Hand over the cigarettes and join your family for dinner. You smoke, don't you? I'm old enough to do what I want. How old are you? High school. Okay, under 18. Um, uh, 
I'm trying to quit that nasty habit. You have to stop while you still can. Frank heaved a sigh, handed me the packet, and oh, good boy. Headed downstairs, I followed him to the living room. The table was prepared, and Monica was ladling the food into the plates. Come on, have a seat. It won't be as tasty if it's cold. As we started eating, the room went quiet. Monica's cooking was as delicious as ever, and, but I had the feeling that wasn't the reason nobody spoke. Monica was the first to break the silence. Say, didn't you know they refurbished the grocery store? I don't know if you remember the owner. He's been there every day for the past 30 years. Can you imagine doing the same job for so long? What if you were president for 20 years, for example? Honestly, would that really be so bad? Monica measured me with her eye for a moment. Anyway, the grocer really is a nice person. He threw in some extra vegetable with my... Frank suddenly slammed his head on the table, rattling the china. Monica, Dina, and I stared at him. So this is how it's going to be. We're just going to sit here like nothing's happened. Dad, you could have been killed. Mom could have been killed. Any one of us could have died. Dana's lower lips start trembling. Monica put her hand on Frank's soldier, uh, sh sh shoulder. Uh, shoulder. 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 Uh, shoulder. Anyways. Um... And yet, we're all still alive. For now. But how long until this happens again? Frank got up from his seat. Fine, let's talk about it. Sit down. Frank took his seat again, scouring. Do you think I will let us go down so easily? Frank smirked. No. But it's not up to you, is it? Hmm. Just trust me, he sighed. Frank, listen to your father. If your father say we don't need to worry, then we don't need to worry. We have to trust him. Monica turned to me. We all have to trust each other. Things calmed down a bit at the table. We finished our food in silence. Frank got up first and retreated back to his room. Monica lifted Deanna up and plopped her in front of the living room TV before returning to the table. She sat across from me. Anton, he's still young. Hmm. Yeah, and that's what worries me. You make plenty of rash decisions now, too, Frank. Not the only one who's scared, Anton. And uh, I promise if there's any threats, you'll be the first one to know. She got up, stood behind me, massaged my shoulders for a moment before leaving me alone in the dining room. I sat in alone at the table, drained my glass of Kebjin. Had I been lying to Frank and Deanna? Was the threat to my family truly over? Time would tell. A few new news articles. Protests across the land. Yes, that seems to be a problem. Sit-ins broke up by riot police and tear gas. Water cannon in the region of Bergia, England. Rooney, a thousand people poured into the Republic Avenue in Lock Haven and Seoul Square in Hosol in response to Yang So's attack. Soon turned into violent riots. Protests in Grinney, people were taking place throughout the Grinney region in response to the assassination of Bernard Sukars. Cost of living inequality. Sit-ins for public transportations. Police violence has surrounded so uh, has surrounded Salt Lake since yesterday. National Front and the oldest NG labor union called for protests. The labor unit fighting for the workers, aka communist idea here, is responding, counter-protest. Hmm. Labor leader, also Buddhist descent. Vandalizing shops. 
office of the National Front Party burned. It's going to be hard to work with them, with them being so bad in the press. We're hoping to pass the reform with them supporting us against the opposition. That might become much more difficult. We still have our security briefing. All right, today's briefing arranged in two parts, starting with eternal matters, moving on to external matters after a short break. The Minister of Interior, Lilis uh, Graf, and the Justice, uh, Nia, join us for the first part. For the second part, we have Ayasof and the Chief of uh, Armed Forces, Vulcan Kruger, and Lucian's here with us as well. Sir. They rose from their seat. Please take your seat. Everyone in the room sat down except for Lucian. He put on his glasses and went through the documents in front of him. Shortly after, he raised his head to address the attendees. Mr. President, ladies, we will kick off today's meeting with internal security briefing. I'm assuming everyone has already been over the agenda. We have all we all have busy schedules, so without much without further ado, I'll jump into our first topic. As we fear, the political atmosphere has worsened. Reports around the country and the contention are rising as we feared. What is the status on Bonarsegur's investigation? I have received news this morning that the investigation into the murder has concluded. Please enlighten us. After further investigation and testimonies, we have confirmed the motive and also the event leading up to the shooting. A few days prior, members of the Red Youth initiated a violent attack on the Yang Sud's local leader in Jen. We believe the Yang Suds then called for revenge, leading to the death of Mr. Sarkar, uh, Sarkars. Since he often spoke against Yang Suds and nationalist sentiment in the assembly, he was a big target, not to mention his radical communist views. Political violence needs to stop now. Yes, we kept at bay for so long, but it seems there are now new triggers. Hands over a report. The investigation revealed a very troubling fact. The funding source of Red Use has clear link to United Cantana. What does this mean? That the communist superpowers meddling in our affairs. Several Red Youth members with ties to United Cantana have been detained, and the information extracted from them point to a preparation for a communist uprising in Sutland. This isn't unusual for the superpowers to influence other nations, but I think this case is a little far-fetched. The left lacked popular support in Sutland. Nia eagerly lifted her hand. I motioned her to speak. I went over the report in detail. It would be wrong to jump to the conclusion about a clear foreign influence yet. United Cantana has humanitarian and cultural ties with many countries, including Sutland. I also don't want to jump to conclusions here. We are against Lilias pretty much on everything so far, which is kind of difficult situation for her, but let's continue. Nearly three decades ago, they founded General Ricard and tried to establish a communist dictatorship in our country. If it was not for Colonel Sol, we would have seen the real crisis. She took a sip from a glass of water and continued. Our police chief, Carl Grisner has linked the funding channel to United Cantana's consul, uh, consulate in Binfi. As we all know, the enemy of Sutland are many, but we also have threats inside the country. We need to remain vigilant. If we give up essential freedom to purchase temporary security, we deserve neither freedom nor security. She's like the moral compass here. This is debatable, but yes, we know what's more, we know what more security and surveillance cause to this country under President Seoul. Let's not forget that President Seoul, God bless him, brought stability after a long period of bloodshed and chaos. But moving on, our highest eternal threat comes from the established, estimated, twenty thousand strong British Freedom Front led by the imprisoned Doolin Arg Arg Argy. Um, they are a banned political organization, now a militant force that is trying to incite racial violence. Are they supported by our Buddhist citizens? To some extent. Luckily, we couldn't attract, they couldn't attract a wide audience of Buddhists. They could potentially threaten thousands if anti-Buddhist sentiment spread in some land again. 
Our intelligence intercepted two crates filled with weapons close to the Rumberg border. They were filled with military grade KA 74s. We expect the we expect more have been smuggled in since a group of boons were caught with these guns at the checkpoint not far away. Rumberg has been acting aggressive in the region for a long time. I'm not surprised they'll attempt to weaponize the Buddhist people against us. This is worrying. Very worrying. Can we... Uh, I don't know if we, we... How would we fare up in the war against them, right? That could be very, very different response here. But let's ask... Not yet, but we have sus suspects that indicate such correlation. This is grave news, but we must be careful not to stoke the fire of anti buddhist sentiment. What is the second most important threat? It is the game violence that's threatening the Nargis and Angerland regions. Two prominent organized crime families are at war, and the potential for, real blood for bloodshed is real. Which two crime families? One is known as the Colonel... Uh, Coronelli's, and the other is the Skinner Cartel. They used to be allies until a recent disagreement. Both are active in the city of Narbel and Estrad to the west, I guess. They're playing with fire. Hmm. Can you handle them? I'm doing my best, sir. I shall be honest with you. With our current capacities, we may not be able to prevent farther arming of separatists while maintaining order in Bergia. Nargis and England. If the law enforcement budget isn't increased, I cannot be fully responsible for what happens. Our police units are spread thin as is. We could increase the budget. We will rid our country from separatists and violent thug if you do so. I wish you would stop using the word thug, Lias. Lilias. The real problem is corruption, which is finally the game violence is very likely the reason why these weapons were smuggled in. A higher budget could help us end that. Hmm. Well, she's the Justice Department, right? We are, but it needs... All the attention it can get from our administration. <laughs> they both want budget added to their department, basically. Thank you for the overview. Have a nice day. Say goodbye to them. And here comes our military men and I believe our yeah, General of the Armed Forces, Minister of Defense. And let's see what we have. Mr. President, uh, as of welcome. I brought General Kruger with me due to the escalation on our borders. Straw draw with strong cheekbones. He's in his 70s, but had a bulking body that was the result of his commando training. Not only was he the second most decorated officer in Sutland, he was also the longest serving. General Kruger, Mr. President, it's an honor. I still tapped his foot impatiently. He seemed uneased with the presence of another high-ranking officer in the room. Gentlemen, thank you for coming for to this significant gathering. Let's begin. Okay. Mr. President, the situation, a situation at the western and northern borders towards Rumberg is very tense. We're observing deployments of divisions CLOS. Close. closer <laughs> to our border. Rumberg has been acting increasingly expansionist in the past decade and also interfering in Angolia. Now they have turned their sights on us. What is your current strategy? Patrolling close to the border with our border force and keeping armed reserve divisions nearby or near. It seems like they want to increase the, press the pressure both externally and internally. Mr. President, if I may. Please, General. The picture is becoming clearer. The latest information from the interior about weapons, caches, 
and now there is an active military buildup close to our border. The entire situation was analyzed by our general staff, and our prediction is a future territorial incursion by Rumberg. I have complete trust in the general staff. We will not let you down, Mr. President. The general staff is composed of the smartest military individuals. I require an increase in military budget to enlist more soldiers. Only then, we can stand strong against our enemies. The enlarged armed forces will hold them at bay. Wilkins is right. We do need an increase in military budget, although we don't see eye to eye exactly how to spend the budget. That much we agree on. I have my concern about Rumberg too. We need strong allies to withstand such a superior power. They are our nemesis. That is an understatement. Times are changing and war is coming, Mr. President. Whether we like it or not, we must be prepared. Do not forget that during the election you promised to focus on the military. I expect the word to be kept for the defense of our nation. And I am a man of my words. Of course, you are, and that's why I follow you, Mr. President. The only way we can guarantee the, na national, uh, the national survival is through a more capable military force against Rumberg. Our country hasn't fallen to any invading force for 200 years. You cannot let it happen, Mr. President. We should find regional allies like Vaugsland, Lesbia, to deter Rumsberg. There are several options on the table. And these options should be considered. They could be considered, but why pander to others when we can solve these issues ourselves? We have no true friend outside these borders. Everyone fell silent when the soldier entered the room and let uh, Lisov know there's a call coming from the ministry. Excuse me, Mr. President. His expression has changed. Mr. President, there has been a Rumbergian military activity close to the Narbil border. I just spoke with the local commander. Well, can we should go to the ministry and get a farther update from our branches? Understood. Stood. Raising military readiness is the first call of action. If there is truly extraordinary attempt, we will relay it to you immediately and wait for further orders, Mr. President. And your service is appreciated, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. President. You shall be updated if the situation escalates. Hail, Sutland. Hail. Rumberg has already it was already testing us, and reports from the interior uh, indicates interference inside our border. Communist, nationalist, British rebels, Rumberg expansionism. What was next? Sutland has always been a key piece in the chessboard of global rivalry between Arcasia and United Comtana, but in recent years there was no such aggression from Rumberg, not at these levels at least. All it takes is one tiny spark to start the flame of war, the phone run. Rumberg had decided to close their consulate in Lockhaven. Well, that is a very bold move. Okay, so with this series of news hitting us, nationwide revolts, neutrality, diplomatic pressure from Rumberg, reduction of diplomatic staff, that's a step the wrong way. But with this, I believe we're going to end our episode. There's a lot of places to spend government budget money. We probably could go into debt given this number is currently green. I'm sure we can go into the red. Uh, we'll see how we do or how we deal with that. Um, and hopefully this construction as that takes two years, right? So it will take quite a while. Um, we'll come back next time and see what type of threat we have to deal with. End of the day, react to the unrest, kind of address the nation, and check out a few more news. So hopefully you guys enjoy this, and see you all next time. Bye!